Good morning. So today we are going to continue our look at um, the theme of the apostolic age and from them he chose 12. Today we're going to be talking about, in, kind of in contrast to the two previous ones, when we looked at, at both St. Peter and then the, the outstanding job that Brainy did last week looking at St. Andrew, um, we're going to be talking today about someone that we actually know very little about outside of early traditions that emerged about him, most of those coming out of the, uh, the old Persian Empire, uh, where he was originally buried. And, uh, and so scripture makes a few mentions of him. And if you got my email yesterday, you, you may have noticed that in that email I quoted the only, the only thing we have from him in scripture that is a direct exchange between he and Jesus that took place at the Last Supper. And it was no small question that he asked of Jesus at the Last Supper. So I'm going to sort of make that kind of a centerpiece of looking at the man we're going to talk about today, who is St. Jude. Um, St. Jude has an interesting name. If you look at, um, at the way that not only in Scripture, but the early fathers identified him, uh, it is unfortunate that apparently his name was Judas. And so part of the problem is that in, in looking at him in history, is that the early fathers, and even if the writers of the, of, the, of the evangelists did this, as you'll see, changed his name somewhat to try to distinguish him, we think, from the other Judas. And so it, it, makes, it makes some of this a little challenging, but, but you'll see where we're going with that. Because he is sometimes identified as Thaddeus. As Thaddeus, also as Jude Thaddeus, uh, in this, as I said, in this attempt to, to sort of distinguish him from the other Judas. So a lot of, of the writers, patristic writers, identified him as Judas Thaddeus, again, in an attempt to distinguish him from Judas Iscariot. And we know him, of course, as the patron today of lost causes or impossible causes or things that just we cannot possibly overcome or see no end to. He is the most popular saint invoked uh, for those types of causes today. It wasn't always that way. Uh, it's interesting that in the early church, uh, this is a devotion that, that was pretty much unknown until we get to uh, really the high middle ages. <clears throat> and really responsible for that is one particular religious order that we're going to talk about who spread this devotion to St. Jude around the world. So how did he come to be known as the patron of lost causes, I think is an interesting question we're going to deal with. His own life, perhaps his own unfortunate name, may be part of the reason for that. Uh, there is some fascinating tradition about him that actually relates at, to the cloth behind me. Well, not this cloth. Did y'all know this is printed on cloth? It is, but... Not this cloth specifically, but the cloth that's in Turin, Italy, of which this is a one-to-one -one scale replica of. There's a very interesting, fascinating tradition about St. Jude that is related to the cloth that's believed to be the burial cloth of Jesus. So we're going to explore that a little bit, too. Y'all knew that. Y'all had to know that was going to be included, right? So what we're going to do is kind of organize it this way and talk about, talk about his life um, as an apostle and martyr. There's not a lot we can say about his about his life as an apostle simply because the scriptures were limited pretty much to that. Um, his martyrdom is, again, um, a matter of our sacred tradition, but it is very good, solid, strong tradition about him. Uh, we're going to look a little bit at one, uh, say I have writings, it's really just one, uh, the Epistle of Jude, and this gives us an opportunity to talk about the contributions of some of these people to our to our text, but also an opportunity to see, to make another point that I find fascinating. For 1900 years, no one ever questioned the authorship of this epistle. Right? And then all of a sudden, in the middle of the, really the middle of the 20th century, late 19th and into the, in the, into the middle of the 20th century, 
all of a sudden the biblical scholars are beginning to cast doubt on whether or not this was the apostle who wrote uh, this epistle. And so I would be remiss if I didn't mention the controversy, but I will tell you that our, our Catholic tradition is pretty solid, and I'm going to invoke some weighty authorities about the authorship of this particular epistle. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that, talk a little bit about him in tradition and legend. So um, by tradition, I'm talking about our sacred tradition, which, remember, is the oral transmission from our deposit of faith. It is the oral transmission of the narrative or the life or the, and the martyrdom of, of St. Jude that comes through our sacred tradition. Legend is something else. Does everybody understand what legend is? <coughs> how, that different, how that differentiates itself from tradition? We would never refer to our deposit of faith as legend. Well, I hope you wouldn't. <laughs> okay? Our deposit of faith, our rich sacred tradition, has much to say about St. Jude. There is also legend, which is, of course, something that is not substantiated necessarily, uh, or it may be found in a written record, but it's not something that can be corroborated by external criteria, which is what the historian always looks for, is a way that we can corroborate a, a story. And so there is an interesting legend about him that I will share with you. And then we're going to talk about him as the patron saint of lost or impossible causes. Okay. All right. So would you please back up and those of us who don't understand all of this, explain the difference between tradition and faith. Okay. So our sacred tradition is considered <coughs> part of our deposit of faith as defined by the church. Our deposit of faith is, is that which has been orally transmitted from Christ through the apostles to the successors of the apostles. It works in the magisterium of the church. Okay. The other part of the, our deposit of faith is our written tradition, which is sacred scripture. So we have sacred tradition and sacred scripture. Sacred tradition is truth. Legend, legend is something that really cannot be corroborated. Uh, it's, it's really of human origin. Uh, in other words, we think of our sacred tradition as being of divi divine origin because it originates with Christ himself through the apostles. Legend is something that's closely related to, I wouldn't say myth, because that's, legend always involves some element of truth. <coughs> so when I say legend, I'm talking about a story that, particularly about him, appears very early, but it is, it is not considered by the church to be part of the tradition of St. Jude. It has an extant source, fourth century source, and is only corroborated really in one account, right? So does everybody understand that sacred tradition is part of our deposit of faith? The truth is transmitted to us two ways, through tradition and through scripture. Yeah. Does that help, James? <coughs> okay, all right. So Jude, or Judas, if you want to call him that, is mentioned only a few times in scripture. So for instance, in Luke's gospel, he is referred to this way. He's called Jude of James. Some translations put him Judas of James, meaning son of James, we assume. Um, Judas, son of James, and he is mentioned in Luke's gospel as one of the apostles. This is in just a, 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 a sort of a rote list, if you will. Then in, and we'll look at some of these, and then in John 14, um, John makes the distinction Remember, John is the last gospel to appear, and so he is feeling the need to maybe edit the others. And what he says about him, he calls him Judas, not Judas Iscariot, okay? Uh, doing his friend a favor, probably, by making sure that everybody knew that I'm not talking about the Iscariot, I'm talking about Judas. And then the writer of the epistle, Jude, who identifies himself as the brother of James. So we have a son, we have a brother. Um... We have one scripture that refers to him as simply of James. So there's a relationship to James. And we believe that this is, uh, this is James the Lesser, who was, of course, in Jerusalem. We believe that, that that's the relationship. Catholic tradition generally holds all of these to be the same person. There is a good bit of biblical scholarship, as I mentioned, particularly in the 20th century, that casts some confusion over the identities involved in these passages based on the names I just told you. And if you started reading that, you would go down a rabbit hole that you would never emerge from. Um, 
It's so convoluted. But our sacred tradition holds that this is the same person that we're describing in all of these accounts. There's also a mention in Matthew's gospel and in Mark's gospel of the brothers of Jesus at Nazareth. They refer to, the, to them that way. And one of the names has been translated again as Judas. Okay, so let's look at these passages. And this is from Luke. You'll see that um, he says, this is in the calling of the twelve, where he names them all. And then he gets here and he says, Judas of James and Judas is Cariot. Okay, so there again is the distinction between two Judases, right? <laughs> then in the Acts of the Apostles, we see this is the this is the scene in the upper room. Okay, this is what is being described in the Acts. Luke is describing the Acts of the Apostles, and he says right here, Judas, son of James. Okay, he mentions all of them being there, and Judas of James is the last one to be mentioned. And we know that that has to be. Jude the Apostle, and why do we know that and not the other Judas? Because Judas was already dead. That's right. Judas Iscariot was already dead. All right, so we, we know, we can pretty much narrow that down to uh, say at least there's another Judas involved here. Okay, and then in John 14, and this is long and I apologize, so I highlighted the part I wanted you to really see, but, but to keep it in its right context, because this is a really important exchange that takes place. The scene is the Last Supper, and which begins really in the, the preceding chapter. But um, this is the, the, the call, the Last Supper discourse. And Jesus is talking here. This is all Jesus' words. And then we get to this. Judas, not the Iscariot, said to him, Master, what happened that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Now, think about the implication of this question. Why are you revealing yourself to us and not the world? And Jesus, of course, goes on to answer him this way. And then I get to this part down here. I put an ellipsis here because I did omit some of this. Sorry, Jesus. It was a long quote. <laughs> but, but this is important. I have told you this while I am with you. The advocate, the Holy Spirit that the Father will send in my name, he will teach you everything and remind you all that I told you. This is the deposit of the apostolic teaching. Do you see that? Jude, Jude is asking the question, why are you telling only us, gives Jesus the opportunity to explain, well, because you're going to be the ones who are going to transmit my teaching. And don't worry, because the Holy Spirit will come to you and will remind you, in case you forgot, will remind you of what I taught you. So this is, to me, one of the most significant passages to underscore what we we're just talking about the deposit of faith, how that teaching of Christ was transmitted through the apostles into the church, into the magisterium today, is right here in this exchange. We have that one we talked about two weeks ago with uh, the exchange between, uh, between Jesus and Peter where uh, he tells him, upon this rock I will build my church. Right? We have that exchange. It establishes the apostolic foundation, and then this is another crucial one, and it involves Jude. Okay, so I think that is not that is not a small thing at all. All right, so is it an unfortunate name? Let's talk about that. An unfortunate name. As I said, the Gospels you've seen the Gospels refer to him as Judas. Um, how did he come to be known as Jude? And what about the name Jude Thaddeus? Well, I've cited Luke, John, the Acts of the Apostles, where he is identified in Judas. Uh, but in Matthew's Gospel and in Mark, where they list the apostles, they name, they, there is no Jude. They name him as Thaddeus. As Thaddeus. And leading many men of the early church, particularly uh, among the fathers of the church, to conclude that this was, in fact, Jude, and that the writers of those Gospels, Matthew and Mark, wanted to not use his real name. Think about it. In the, early, in the earliest apostolic community, there would have been this need. This, we, see it, we see what John does with his name. There would have been this desire to distinguish him somehow from the other Judas. And I think that that's what's going on in Matthew and Mark, who are the earliest Gospels to appear. 
um, was this, this need to dis distinguish him somehow. It is a position that we find that is cemented in all of the, um, the hagiography or the story, the lives of the saints. There's one in particular, if you came to Dr. Helen Taylor's talk, many of you came to that, when she did, she talked about the golden legend uh, that's published in the, uh, in the 13th century that's the compilation of all of the stories of the lives of the saints. Uh, it's called the golden legend. She finds, uh, you find in that, um, there is um, uh, a reference to, to Jude this way in the golden legend. This Judas was called by many names. He was called Judas James, or Judas of James, for he was the brother or son of James, the brother of James the Less, and he was called Thaddeus. Now, the, the, in the Golden Legend, it's not really explaining what all this is, which is, as, which is as much to say at taking a, taking a position that he was from Thaddea. Okay? For he was certainly of God, certainly of the chosen, an ornament of virtue, and followed Christ clearly. So that's in the golden legend. That tells us that, that by the high middle ages there is a strong tradition in the church that is captured in the golden legend that expresses this need to change his name and to distinguish him. So what do we know of his life? Okay, again, his life goes back to sacred tradition. We know from sacred tradition that he preached the gospel throughout Judea. He then traveled to Asia Minor, which is today Turkey. He even went into parts of the Persian Empire, which, of course, is where uh, he was martyred. We'll talk about that in a minute. Tradition holds that he was born in Galilee. Um, like many people in that part of the world, we have very good reason to believe that his language was, his first language was probably Aramaic. Although he, like most people of that area who were engaged in any kind of business, he would have had some rudimentary Greek, at least a little bit of Greek he would have been familiar with. And according to the golden legend, he was a farmer and not a fisherman. Um, Although there are also, there's also a, a, an early tradition that he was a carpenter. So a carpenter and a farmer, but distinguished from the others, and he's not a fisherman. Uh, like almost all of his contemporaries in the area at that point in time, he would have been get engaged in some type of manual labor, for sure. According to our sacred tradition, uh, St. Jude was martyred in the year 65, around the time of the death of both uh, St. Peter and St. Paul. Uh, he was martyred <clears throat> in the year 65 in Armenia. Okay, everybody know where Armenia is? Today, just to the west of Turkey, excuse me, just to the east of Turkey, south of the Caucasus Mountains, um, Azerbaijan is to the, <laughs> Azerbaijan is to the east, uh, the Republic of Georgia now is to the north. Y'all kind of get the area we're talking about. <clears throat> he was martyred in Armenia uh, with Saint, uh, by tradition with the, uh, the other apostle, St. Simon the Zealot, who was traveling with him. Uh, I'm sure that that's something we'll explore when we look at Simon as well. This is actually recorded in a, uh, a non-canonical text. Y'all heard me talk about these before a non-canonical early Christian text called the Acts of Simon and Jude that tells us that um, the club-headed Acts that he is often depicted with, let me go back so you can see that, uh, he's often depicted in artwork. This is El Greco's, by the way, from the early 17th century, depicts him with the instrument of his martyrdom. And he's often depicted this way. What is missing from this particular depiction of St. Jude is the most common way he is depicted, which you'll see in a minute, uh, is with an image of Christ with him. Um, so he was martyred, we believe, um, right here in this region of the Persian Empire. And again, that is very good tradition. Their acts in martyrdom, as I said, were recorded in this extra-biblical text that was recorded by a second-century bishop of Babylon, a bishop named Abdias. We have no reason to doubt the truth of that story. Just didn't make the canon of scripture. 
Originally, his tomb was in Persia. He, we believe he was buried uh, somewhere there, and I've got a, a pretty good idea where I'll show you in a minute. Tradition holds that so many pilgrims came to venerate uh, his tomb after he was buried that there are some early, early stories told in the Golden Legend about profound miracles taking place at his grave. And we're, I'm, I'm not saying that not all, all miracles, of course, are extraordinary, okay? But I'm talking about how the reputation began to spread, and this is certainly true by the high Middle Ages, that if you had something really difficult, really impossible, to take it to St. Jude. Because St. Jude had demonstrated from the beginning that he wanted the hard challenge. He wanted the impossible. And there's some interesting stories that come out by the high middle ages about why it is that you go to St. Jude with your impossible cause. Anybody want to guess? Why St. Jude would want to take on these impossible causes? Because of his name. Because he's the forgotten apostle. And he wants people to know he will work for you. So, so bring me the hard stuff. You know, this is interesting the way the medieval mind worked, but that's how the medieval pilgrim explained it, was, well, he's, he's probably not very busy. People aren't calling upon the name of Jude or Judas, right? So uh, anyway, I think that's kind of interesting. Um, we have also some, some very good evidentiary proofs from both history and archaeology that St. Jude was in this part of the world because, number one, the, the rite, the liturgy of the Armenian church is, by their tradition, is they, they say that it, they, it came from St. Jude. Um, they claim it's is, is, is directly derived from him. But also, I mean, this is fascinating, there are the ruins of an ancient monastery. Now, this is actually a medieval structure. Some of this, some of the newer portions here, I believe right here, are from the 18th century. But the foundations of this building uh, our first century. And this is a structure that by tradition, this is called St. Thaddeus Monastery, or the Monastery of St. Thaddeus. It is in Armenia. And it, the claim here is that it was built on the site of the first century church that originally housed the relics of St. Jude. So it is still obviously very much today a site of pilgrimage. Uh, and it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site today, by the way. But this archaeology and the tradition of the devotion here, going back for centuries, adds even more veracity to the tradition that he was in Armenia. Do you see? The fact that they have this structure that's dedicated to him, and as far back as the records go, it's dedicated to St. Thaddeus. Um, and also, I think it's, it's, it makes it easier for us to make a link to a legend we're going to talk about uh, in a minute. At some point, his remains were brought from Armenia to Rome, where they are today in St. Peter's Basilica. Uh, we believe that those were transferred in, this, in uh, um, well, it was their current location, obviously, in, this, in the 17th century, 16th or 17th century, after the new St. Peter's was built. But before then, they were held at, at, the, at the same site, the old church. So we're not exactly sure when they were translated from Armenia to, uh, to Rome. But he and St. Simon the Zealot rest together. Their bones are together. Um, all right, so, although there may not be much, sorry about this, can you read that? <laughs> although, although we may not be able to glean much about his personality from the gospel accounts, we know so little uh, from scripture, a Saint Jude, I can tell you this, if you're eager to know something about his personality, he was apparently a man of few words. Uh, St. Jude is overwhelmingly held, of course, to be the author of the epistle bearing that name, which after the second and third epistles of John is the shortest work in the New Testament. 25 verses. That's all you get. That's all you get. Uh, it opens with this declaration. Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and brother of James. See, he identifies himself as the brother of James. And we think, as I said, this is James the less. A slave of Jesus Christ and brother of James. To those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept safe for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. And that's how he opens his letter. 
So the Epistle of Jude, what you're looking at is actually the oldest known copy of it. This is a papyrus, uh, I believe it's called number 66. It's held in the Vatican Codex. Uh, it dates to the early 4th century. And it has a really interesting story in history, uh, in the history of the entire Bible canon, as a matter of fact. It has a great history. Um, the, the work is generally, if you've read Jude, you know this, it's generally an exhortation, encouragement, but also calling people out who are beginning to follow false teachings. Or, um, it, it gives us a sense that there is, by the time that it was written, we think, um, about the year 60, that by that time there were already some controversies in the church that were splintering groups that were causing people to follow false teachers. And so he, he exhorts people to remember the teachings of Christ, uh, calls them to remember, um, to, to heed the, the, the teachings of the apostles, okay, to stay true to doctrine. And as I said, if you remember when we explored the definition of the apostolic age, the very first beginning when we started this in January and I told you, kind of gave you the parameters of that. Do, do y'all remember the apostolic age? We're talking about less than 100 years. And so this gives us some perspective that if it's written about the year 60 and he is already calling out um, people who are following false teachers, false doctrine, we're only 30 years into the church. And this is already, already an issue, already falling into heresy. And so what St. Jude does is he encourages people to, quote, fight hard for the faith. Fight hard for the faith. And he challenges people this way, quote, grow strong in your holy faith through prayer in the Holy Spirit. Correct those who are confused. The others you must rescue. I love this part. The others you must rescue, snatching them from the fire. So clearly, I mean, as, as a historian, I can tell you, looking in on a sacred text like this, what we're looking for are kind of clues as to what the culture of the community was like. And we have a clear sense that there is a lot of false teaching. And that's directly what he is, he is um, undertaking in this, in this writing. So, again, making that link, and I think it's important to... Um, to go back to the exchange at the Last Supper and see how Jesus answered Jude when he questioned, why are you telling this only to us? This is Jude's way of passing that on and making sure people know. Because he says, listen to the teachings of the apostles. Right? Okay, so um, the work is also interesting, I'm, and I'm going to go down a little bit of a rabbit trail here, but I think that it's, it's really fascinating. The text is interesting because it contains a reference to a work that is not found in the canon of Scripture. He references it. As a matter of fact, he doesn't reference it. He quotes it. He quotes an external source from the Bible, from the, from the Bible canon, although obviously uh, St. Jude could not have known that this work would not be included in Scripture. I'm talking about the Book of Enoch. Are y'all familiar with what that is? The Book of Enoch? You've heard of it? It is referenced by almost all of the church fathers. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ancient Hebrew text that was excluded from the Jewish canon the Jewish uh, canon does not include it either. The book of Enoch, uh, again, written in ancient Hebrew, is believed by many to have been written by the grandfather of Noah, or that is the tradition that is associated with, with the book of Enoch. Um, and we know from many sources, for, as I said, throughout the entire early patristic age in the church, many of the fathers are referencing Enoch. And... It's, it's referenced by Jewish writers as well. Fragments of it were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, for instance, when they made that found, find uh, in the 1940s at, at, um, uh, at Masada. Fragments of it were found there. And Jude quotes it because Enoch, the book of Enoch, whoever the author was, by, by Jewish tradition it was the grandfather of Noah, warns about false teaching to the Jews. 
Enoch is also interesting where we find the origin of a lot of our tradition about demons as fallen angels, by the way. That comes from the book of Enoch. Um, the story about Michael kicking uh, Lucifer out of heaven is in Enoch. Okay? The only place really where we see much um, information given about any of the archangels, Raphael, for instance, is found in the book of Enoch. So lots about angels and demons uh, in Enoch. So along with the fact that, that Jude quotes this text, the early, and a direct quote from Enoch, by the way, the early fathers of the church all quoted that text. Uh, it is viewed today by the Ethiopian church as being one of their inspired texts. In other words, like our Apocrypha, the part of our canon that we call deuterocanonical that we don't, it's not included in the canon, but we do readings from it, the Apocrypha. For the Ethiopian church, they use the Book of Enoch as one of those. And so this, this just speaks to how widely that particular text was known that Jude even quotes it. The other reason I think that the book of Jude is interesting is its, its view, uh, as I said, by the early fathers of the church. As the canon of scripture was being put together by this consensus uh, of people who are, who are compiling, in authority, bishops mostly, who are compiling lists that are permitted to be read in churches. I mean, you can imagine, if all of a sudden the Christian communities throughout, uh, throughout the Christian world are being flooded with text and documents, um, these, these gospels, the gospel of Peter, the gospel of Mary Magdalene, the gospel of Judas, and these, these start flooding these communities, then obviously there is a need for a bishop in the role of the teaching authority to say, these are the books you can read. You understand? I mean, imagine the process of really not having a communal <coughs> life, not of being in a situation where you don't have a text somebody hands you and says, this is approved, right? This is inspired and these other ones are not. So what happens as a result is the bishops begin to, to, to put together what they know to be authenticated text, apostolic text. They begin producing lists. Does that make sense? So um, one of the earliest to do this was actually um, St. Irenaeus of Lyon in the middle of the second century who published a list and basically said these are the books that you can read uh, in the churches. Um, that includes almost all of what is our canonical New Testament today with a couple of exceptions that are excluded, but nothing added that we don't currently have. Uh, so St. Jude is on all of those early lists. This epistle of Jude is in all of the early lists. And importantly, the epistle is listed in something called the Muratorian Fragment. And you're looking at a, at a leaf of that. Uh, the Muratorian Fragment, let me tell you what this is. This dates to the year, it's been dated to the year 150. 150. Um, and it's called the Muratorian Fragment because um, it was found in a, in a library um, by that name. <coughs> Uh, today it is in the Ambrosian Library in the city of Milan. It was found in the 17, no, excuse me, 18th century. It was found in 1740. But the document dates to the year 150. And how do we know that? Or about 150. And the reason we know that is, is well, first of all, um, linguistic scholars have looked at it and said it is a, is a mid-2nd century uh, work. But more importantly, the, the writer of the document gives us some internal clues. For instance, he refers to the Pope as pious, of blessed memory, of recent memory is how he refers to him. Well, y'all, there are 12 piouses. Do you know this? There's 12 pious, 12 Pope by the name of Pius in the history of the church, and he refers to him as pious. What does that tell you? He's the first. So, so that places the text chronologically for us right there, and it's been dated other ways. The reason this is important is because the writer of this fragment, and we have to call it fragment because we, we're missing the first part of it, he lists the books that he says, these are the books that the bishops agree can be read in churches. And in order, almost exactly as we have them today, are the books of the New Testament, with a couple of exceptions. They excluded, whoever the writer was, excluded 
uh, the revelation of John, and even comments about why that is, that people think it's weird, okay? Um, which some of the fathers write about, Irenaeus writes about that. You know, we're just not sure about this one. Hebrews, because they couldn't verify the authorship of Hebrews, and you know, today we still don't know who wrote Hebrews. Uh, it did become part of the canon of scripture, and excluded, I think, one or two of the epistles of John and or Peter. But the rest of the, the, the works that are listed in this fragment, from 150, do you realize we're only a generation removed? <clears throat> At the most, two generations removed from the apostles? Uh, include Jew. So I find it interesting that um, that today, <clears throat> excuse me, there could be some controversy about the authorship of Jude when clearly the consensus of the early church was that he was the one who wrote it. So, I mean, we could talk all day about what that is. Why is it that all of a sudden the modern and postmodern modern scholar knows more about the Bible than anybody who, like, put it together? <laughs> Have you ever thought about that? But, but it's true. I mean, for instance, there's, a, there's and I don't want to go too much of a rabbit trail here, but there's a whole uh, movement in biblical scholarship today to essentially discredit the epistles of Paul and say that Paul didn't write any of them. Or if he wrote them, maybe he just wrote one or two of them, but the rest of them were communities that followed Paul. And so, uh, and I'm not saying this is Catholic biblical scholarship because it's not, but there's a lot of this out there. If you go and read about scholarship in the Bible today, that's what you're going to find. And Jude has fallen under that, um, that sort of, of suspicion, if you will. So the other thing I think that's interesting is that um, uh, y'all heard me talk about uh, one of the apostolic fathers, St. Polycarp of Smyrna. Polycarp was a disciple of the Apostle John. He was baptized by the Apostle John. He tells us that. And so he's a very good, early, uh, reliable witness. He was martyred in the year 155 in, in Smyrna. And um, his opinion, his um, authority, if you will, carries great weight in the early church. And St. Polycarp of Smyrna tells us in, in his letter to the Philippians that he wrote about the year 110. So this is very early. He's writing about the year 110. He directly quotes the epistle of Jude. And he doesn't just quote it. He says in the words of the apostle, and then he quotes. So... Clearly, I don't think there seemed to have been any question for these early authorities uh, of the church. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that, um, that when you look at St. Jude, as he is depicted uh, to us visually today, either in visual art and statuary, however you might see him, medals, uh, there, are, there are a couple of attributes. <clears throat> Commonly, as I mentioned, he is depicted either with a club or, an, or an, it's actually, most of the time it's depicted as, an, as kind of an axe-headed, or a club-headed axe, would be a better way to say it. Depicted with that in his hand, which of course is not uncommon for, um, for martyrs to be depicted with the instruments of their martyrdom. He's also often depicted with a quill or a scroll. So what does that make reference to? His epistle of 25 verses, right? <coughs> Probably didn't need much ink. That's probably why he's not holding any. But, <laughs> but he's, he's always depicted sort of that way. But the, the thing that, that you didn't see in the other image of him is what is around his neck. You see that? He is either carrying the face of Christ on something or he's wearing it around his neck. Uh, almost always you see him that way. And sometimes it's very, very vivid. Like he's got a, like a huge, uh, either he's carrying a huge metal, or sometimes it's a cloth. Sometimes it's a piece of cloth that has the face of Jesus on it. And this is really fascinating. It's always close to his chest. He's either, it's either here near his heart or he's holding it up near his heart. And this, the story behind this is nothing really short of fascinating. How many of you remember um, Eusebius of Caesarea? Come on. <laughs> Y'all should know him by now. He is the, uh, the 
historian for the Emperor Constantine, who's the one who wrote what's called the Ecclesiastical History of the Church from Christ to Constantine. Now, y'all, I have quoted this a million times. Um, and Eusebius is an excellent source for a lot of history, um, is particularly around like the Council of Nicaea of 325. He gives us the only full account of that council and the formation of our creed, for instance, which is why he is so often invoked as a historian. But he also includes in his ecclesiastical history some of the stories, and he identifies them that way. He says these are legends. These are things that have come down to us um, that cannot really be substantiated, you know? So they're not sacred tradition. That's what I'm saying. This is a legend I'm getting ready to tell you. I want to be sure I make the difference between, between what, I'm, what I'm saying, tradition and legend. Um, so he tells us, you see this in Caesarea, as it tells us this incredible legend. He relates that in the first century, there was a king in Edessa. And if you want to know where Edessa is, it's in the eastern part of Asia Minor, Turkey. And there was a king there by the name of Abgar, King Abgar, Abgar V, as a matter of fact. And we're talking about the year 50 to 60, or, I'm sorry, um, that's the time of the visit. That he, that backing up to the life of Jesus, so maybe like 30, that King Abgar wrote a letter to Jesus. Wrote a letter to him. And copy, a copy of this letter was supposedly seen by a pilgrim named Ergeria who, who wrote a diary of her travels through the Holy Land in the third or fourth century. Uh, that's really the only reference we have to this letter. She says she saw it. But anyway, the story goes <clears throat> that King Abgar wrote Jesus a letter because he was ill. <clears throat> he wanted Jesus to heal him. And <clears throat> the story also goes on to say that Jesus responded um, <clears throat> to King Abgar and told him that he would send someone, that he would send someone to see him. And what happens next in the story is that about the year 50, 55, one of the disciples appears in Edessa. By, by, by the, the legend, uh, Eusebius identifies this apostle as St. Jude. St. Jude comes to Edessa with a cloth that bears the image of Christ. And King Abgar was healed of his illness. Okay? That's the legend of Abgar. And so, is there anything to the legend? Well, I mean, I can tell you that certainly this is how he is always depicted is with an image of Jesus. And we know for certain from external histories, there is a relic that was being venerated in Edessa up until about the year 525 for certain, well, actually longer than that. Um, there's an image in Edessa. It's sometimes called just that, the image of Edessa. Sometimes it's called, in Greek, the akaryopoitos, which literally translates to image not made by human hands. So something that had an image but was not created. Uh, there was something in Edessa, we know from many, many, many records, that it was venerated in Edessa. It was even stored above the gates to the city and a niche in the wall when that city was, was uh, threatened by a flood. <coughs> Later emperors, Justinian even does this, he attributes this relic to saving the city from the plague. Then, in 944, we have a record that there is a cloth from Edessa that was transferred to Constantinople on August 15th. We have the exact date because the emperor who received it in Constantinople wrote about it. He venerated it that night. There was a special mass the next day, and he received this cloth from Edessa. Okay? So we know, we know that story is true. Could it be true that St. Jude took the burial cloth of Jesus to Edessa? Um, there are certainly a lot of people who believe that, and I will add just one more thing to this, and then I'm going to, um, well, I, no, I'm not going to add just one more thing. I'm going to add a couple more things. Because <laughs> I can't leave it there. 
This is a 10th century icon. So this is from the 9th, from the 900s. This is painted into the wall of St. Catherine's Monastery on Mount Sinai in Egypt. It is king, and it's titled King Abgar receiving the cloth, that they call it the Mandelian, the cloth. Um, king Abgar receiving the Mandelian from St. Jude. And I mean, obviously this is a crude depiction, right? But in the ninth century, the tradition uh, was, was very much part of the community of this monastery, this, this legend of Abgar, as we call it. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Could this be the shroud that is currently held in Turin, Italy today? There is a lot of speculation that it is, in fact, the very same. As a matter of fact, there's an Oxford historian named Dr. Ian Wilson who's done a lot of work on this. He argues that it is, and I'm going to tell you why he argues it is. There are pollens on that cloth that were taken in the 1970s that place it geographically in the area of Edessa at some point in its history. So, um, it's a fascinating thing to consider anyway. Okay, so this story actually is so intertwined with St. Jude that on St. Jude's feast day in the Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, which is August 21st, in, our, in, in the Western Church, his feast day is October 28th. It's celebrated the same day as St. Simon the Zealot. Um, but on the Eastern calendar, it's, it's August 21st. And on that day, the Eastern Orthodox have a simultaneous a feast um, that is called the Feast of the Image of Edessa. It's celebrated on the same day. And that has been on the Eastern calendar since about the third century. So, is there something to this? Okay, so how does he get the title the Patron of Lost Causes? As I mentioned earlier, we know that there was some speculation about his name being changed, the name being changed to protect the innocent, right? You could really say that. Um, and, and we know that from, from sacred tradition that he was buried um, uh, in Armenia before his, or in, somewhere in the Persian Empire there, before his relics were transferred to Rome. So this tradition began that he was a powerful intercessor for impossible causes. Um, and, and as I said, to the medieval mind, the reason for this is, quite simply, that he felt like St. Jude, they attribute all this these personality qualities to St. Jude, the medieval mind would say, well, he was ignored. He was forgotten. Um, he was upset that his name was that of a traitor, right? And this is nowhere in our sacred tradition. I'm talking about this is what medieval pilgrims would say about St. Jude. And so, because of this, St. Jude was eager to help. And very rapidly into the Middle Ages, this, this begins, this practice begins of taking him the most challenging causes that you have. Take him the impossible. And then something very important happens in the 13th century that solidifies this. There is a new, brand new religious order called the Dominicans. Right? St. Dominic Guzman, founded in the early 13th century. And the Dominicans... Uh, their mission, remember that they, that's the order of preachers, and, it's, and they are a, um, what's known as a, as a mendicant order, meaning they don't live cloistered lives behind monastery walls, but they go out into the communities, they go out into the world and preach and teach. And, and so the Dominicans, of course, had missions that went around the known world in the 13th century. And one of the places they went was, guess where? Armenia. Okay. So when the Dominicans went to Armenia in the 13th century, they found a very strong devotion to St. Jude already there um, because the apostle was buried there. So they found this, this tradition, and the order took it upon themselves to not only nurture that devotion to St. Jude, but the order took over as custodians and caretakers of his relics. Okay, Dominicans did. Um, so they spread the devotion of St. Jude, which we think may have been minimal at this point, outside of Armenia. They spread that devotion of St. Jude first to Spain. Remember that St. Dominic Guzman was Spanish, 
So it's taken first to Spain, and by the 16th century, well, where is Spain? Everywhere in the world, really, the New World, right? We're talking about New World conquest, colonization. Um, so Dominican missionaries bring that devotion to St. Jude to the New World, uh, by extension then, of course, into the United States, or what will become the United States. So it's interesting that some of the legend, uh, as I said, uh, even among the Dominican records, is that he was the ignored apostle. And that part of their teaching ministry in the New World, even in Europe, was to raise awareness of St. Jude. And so there is today, um, of course, a um, the Dominican um, order in the United States is... Uh, has a shrine to St. Jude in Chicago. Uh, this is the national shrine to St. Jude is in Chicago. And they have um, the largest relic of St. Jude that's known to exist outside of Rome, and it's his forearm, the hand and the forearm. It's a large, large relic of St. Jude. And the tradition about that is very good, that when his relics were translated from Armenia to Rome, that the Dominicans took a piece of him. And that's... Um, Kind of the tradition about that. Uh, of course, the other thing is that that um, we know in the United States that one of his namesakes is obviously a hospital that's devoted to uh, the care of children with cancer, and um, which is itself a, I've got some very remarkable stories of miraculous recoveries uh, for children. And so that that place is probably very aptly named. Uh, it was founded in 1962. <coughs> Again, um, sort of centered on this devotion to St. Jude as, as being the one associated with impossible causes. So have a church across the river. Right. Yeah, at a church in, in at a church in North Bajor. <clears throat> okay. How are we doing on time? Oh, I finished early. <laughs> How did I do that? We must do we need to start early. What, what questions do you have for me today? Since we've got some time to fill, you can ask me anything that I know the answer to. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I have once we want, remembered that uh, Antonio Lucas made the comment that early Christians did not necessarily wear a cross around them like uh, we do today. Right. And therefore, it's probably very common to yeah, so the, the observation was that it was not um, common among early Christians to wear a cross, which is true. Um, as long as crucifixion was the state method of execution in the Roman Empire, which it was until about 320, year 320, nobody would have had a cross in public. I mean, that's... It was a state method of execution. I mean, that'd be like us wearing a little electric chair around our necks, you know? <laughs> well, or uh, gurney with a little IV pole attached or something. But, um, no, so it's not, it's not something that, that Christians would have worn. The reason I find that this particular depiction of St. Jude with the image is so, and I don't think it's related to that. I think it's related to the legend of Atgar. I think it's related to the legend that he took this cloth to Edessa. And because we don't see that among with any of the other apostles. We also don't see any evidence that early Christians were using an image of Jesus as a way of identifying themselves. Because the earliest Christian symbol was the ichthus, the fish. That's what everybody used for the first centuries during times of persecution, was the ichthus. Yes? The cloth, the fact that Well, actually, we have good reason to believe that the image has only faded across the centuries. We have, in, in, in our own collection, we have artworks that were done in the 16th and 17th, 18th centuries, uh, artist depictions that show the image much more dark than it appears today. And so, and we know just since the time it's been studied since 1898 that the image has faded. So I think, I think that, that absolutely, absolutely, I think when that cloth was taken, um, first to Antioch and then to Odessa, you would have been able to see an image on it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can look at it right here. He looked hard enough, you can see the face. Mm 
You know, imagine that being folded in a way that only the face was visible. Yes? What do we know about just the face cloth that was placed across his face first? Would it have been? Wrong. So, do you know anything about that? To me, it makes sense that maybe that was, you know, not saying. Except it doesn't have an image on it. We, we know where that is? Yeah. Okay. So you're talking about in, um, make sure we're talking about the same cloth. So in John's Gospel, chapter 20, where he tells the resurrection story, and he says that John and Peter ran to the tomb, Peter ran in the tomb, they saw the burial linens lying there, and John describes um, the burial linens, the word he uses in Greek is aphonia, which is plural, okay? So, but he also says, including the cloth that had covered Jesus' face, and he even goes on to say that it was rolled up in a separate place by itself. John gives us all that detail. Is that the one you're talking That's about? That's what I'm talking about. So that do doesn't have an image on it. Okay, I, we know a lot about it. Um, that doesn't have an image on it. And that cloth, um, we have a chain of custody for beginning in the year 613. It showed up in Spain in a reliquary, an ancient reliquary, that was reported to have belonged to the Apostle James. So what, again, making an interesting connection to Jude. If they're brothers, so James has the face cloth, mm -hmm. and it was in a reliquary stored in the church in Jerusalem and probably was there until the Persian invasions of the leading up to early 7th century. So 613 would have been about the time to try to get those relics out of Jerusalem. It ends up in Spain, and there is a forensic match. There is no question, I think forensic experts have all... This is in peer-reviewed journals. They have all testified about this with blood spatter technology and everything we know, that the sudarium that's held in Oviedo, Spain, covered the face of the same man as the shroud in Turin. They covered the same face. There's over 150-something points of agreement in blood spatter, which is 10 times what you need in the court of law. And um, it's the same blood type. So that seems to me more logical Except it doesn't have an image on it. It doesn't have an image on it. The sudarium doesn't have an image. Well, there's there's no image. Of, there's no there's nothing like this. Right. So we know um, from some some textile experts that have studied this cloth back here um, have argued based on fold patterns that at some point in its history it was held in a reliquary that showed just the face. It was folded in a way that would show just just the face. Um, and you know, and we again, we know that from like Pilgrim's accounts in, in Constantinople in the 13th century, <coughs> who report having seen the cloth that it was folded, and so that seems more likely to me because there is no image on the sudarium. You see, the sudarium would have been removed before the body was enshrouded. It covered his face when he came down from the cloth, but because it had blood and body fluid on it. It's considered under Jewish law to be part of the body. It had to be placed in the tomb. So that's the reason. Barry Schwartz tells the story. If y'all remember when he was here, he tells the story about when he read John's gospel, it clicked that he's Jewish. He said that's a Jewish burial because they included the cloth that had covered his head. Under Jewish law, it had to be with the body. So it wouldn't have been buried. It wouldn't have been under the shroud. That's no. what I always thought. So no. it was separate. And John tells us it's in a separate place by itself. There's no image on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Yes? What about the Veil of Veronica? The Veil of Veronica is an interesting artwork. I, I can't speak to that as a miraculous image. I mean, the church does not pronounce on it. They only show it about, what, five minutes every couple of years or something. Um, there's an interesting tradition, of course, that um, Veronica was a woman, the, the woman on, we even had the Station of the Cross, there, where she wipes his face, and there's this image that's left on the cloth. The problem is that that image is nothing like what we're talking about here. It's explainable. It appears to be an artwork. Um, and, 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 you know, as, as our tradition goes, remember that Veronica is a name that means true. That means true icon. So, I'm not suggesting that's not that 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 the the tradition about a woman wiping his face. I'm not suggesting that's not true. 
um, I'm suggesting that it's not the same level. It's not the same level as this, I promise you. This image can't be explained. Hmm? Well, it is tradition in our church. Um, but I wouldn't say it's strong tradition. No. Mm -mm. I mean, and you know, this is where the church, I think, in its wisdom, in, in her great wisdom, does not pronounce on the authenticity of any relic. We've talked about that in here before. That the church will say it's worthy to be venerated. Which is a good place to leave it, right? Just leave it with, and Father Spitzer talked about that. Uh, I don't know how many of you follow him on EWTN, but that was part of his talk he gave in D.C. at the Museum of the Bible where I was, was he talked about, um, in his presentation about this call, the church doesn't pronounce on its authenticity, and that that's a good thing, because it calls people into the mystery, and it lets you, it lets it be personal for you. Yes? No, there, there is blood on the cloth. The blood is present before the image was made. So the man bled before the image, whatever the process was that created the image. But um, the, the problem with, with, with saying that the resurrection caused the image is that we cannot replicate it. Scientifically, we cannot do that in a laboratory. And so um, what, what I tend to tell people, and, and I, of course, you know, y'all know this, I mean, I do shroud presentations literally all over the world, and what I always tell people because inevitably someone will say to me, well, you know, doesn't this prove the resurrection? We have to be careful about that because when we use the word proof, we are in a realm of, of, of man. We're in the realm of man because science is a, is a measure of man. You know what I mean? That's our way of knowing, a way of knowing we can quantify something in the material world. And so what I always tell people is if this is, in fact, a natural effect, and I believe it is, it's a natural effect of a supernatural event. But this is the physical remain of a metaphysical event, right? We can explain this. We can measure it and say, well, it's a saccharide, it's sugar, it's this many five rolls deep. It's, we can tell you everything about it. We just can't replicate it. So what I always tell people is that when we talk about proving a resurrection, how do you plan to do that? How are you going to replicate that in a laboratory? So I prefer to say it that way. I believe it is a natural effect of a supernatural event. And science can't extend into the realm of the supernatural. I mean, science can't measure that. So now, do I believe that the man in this cloth was resurrected? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Right, right. Well, I mean, and, and look, I tell people this all the time. This is the single most studied object in all of human history. Nobody has studied anything more in history than this claw. And every time we answer a question, we get a new question. Objects of the material world always give up their mysteries. We study something enough and we're going to figure out how it was done. We can't do this. We can't do this. We can't create... 34 trillion watts of energy, which is what it is, 34 trillion watts of energy, power Manhattan Island for a year, in a nanosecond on a 14 and a half strip of linen cloth. I don't know anybody that can do that. Nobody can do that. Nobody here can do that. <laughs> Nobody here can do that. Right, right. Which, you know, that's, well, I won't even go there, never mind. I was gonna say, that's why, that's why Barry is still, is still, um, he still asks questions because he says he, he's not quite there where he thinks that there's not a natural explanation. <laughs> you know, we're like, well, there, it is a natural, there is a natural explanation. There's a chemical process that takes place in the cloth, 
the changes the the leaves a, leaves an imprint on the fibers of the cloth. There is that that is that's a natural process, but it has a supernatural cause, and it's a spectrum of light on the order of thirty four trillion watts. Yes. There's two instances in the Bible where they mention light, the transfiguration, and um, and I just lost my mind. Oh, and when Saint Paul, you know, was the light blinded his eyes. It was such a bright light. Right. And I just feel like, well, it, maybe it's that. Yes. Well, and remember that John's whole gospel is is that language, yeah. that it is light. It's in our creed that he is that he is God from God, light from light. I mean, it's even so so. I, you know, that does not surprise me that it would be light that would do this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Going back to the first writing of the St. Jude, the first picture that you showed, you said it was 4th century? Which one? Uh, go back to the, seems the, no, no, that This one? one? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no, the, le the, the, the story from Eusebius appears in the 4th century. Not that one. But no, the, this is yeah, this okay. is this is a nineteenth century painting. Oh, the writing. Oh, not that one. That one. That. You said that was fourth. They did the yeah. The, this is a, a papyrus that's dated to the early fourth century. So you know, obviously these um, these biblical letters, epistles, gospels were all copied uh, okay. and and distributed around the world before we could print books. Okay. And so this is this is the earliest known copy of Jude. We have fragments of some of the Gospels that are very early, you know, like late first century, but this is fourth century. Yes? In what city did you say was the largest uh, relic? Uh, I believe it's in Chicago, their, their national shrine, the Dominicans National Shrine of St. Jude. Now, and you know, and, and, and as you ask that question, now I'm wondering, I mean, I'm not sure that it permanently is housed there. It may be with, permanently housed with the Dominican order, uh, wherever their superior house is, for the, like the whole world. But I know that it was recently in Chicago, uh, because I remember seeing something about an invitation to attend, they were gonna have a public viewing. It's not on display all the time. But I've seen, I've seen photographs of it. I mean, it's, in a, it's kind of in a metal reliquary, and it's like, it looks like this. It's the hand and forearm. Oh, well, I mean, we got a little bit of time, so that's that's good. Who did you say he's in with? Saint Simon the Zealot. Okay. Who we'll be talking about in a little bit, I think. So next week, um, I am going to do uh, a presentation on the Apostle to the Apostle, Saint Mary Magdalene, and um, and, and and to be clear, uh, of course, I know that she is not one of the twelve called apostles. Okay, uh, but. One of the reasons that we titled this the way that we did, and from them he chose 12, was to be sure that we highlighted the lives of the 12 apostles. And then we subtitled it The Apostolic Age, which would give us some breadth to deal with figures like St. Paul. I couldn't have included St. Paul, for instance, had we not taken some liberties outside of the call 12. So yes, I know she's not, she's not an apostle, but we'll say this, that uh, obviously her... Um, she has been elevated now to a feast, um, and of course, uh, Saint Fra uh, Pope, not Saint Francis. That would have been a long time ago. Um, Pope Francis has uh, has continued to refer to her as the apostle to the apostles. So she is someone who clearly had a major role in that apostolic community, and it will be interesting to explore her life from the perspective of scripture. She, of course. Um, um, does not have as many appearances as scripture in scripture as you might think and uh, our tradition the early tradition of the church about her has been somewhat revised by future popes so it'll be an interesting thing to unpack about her <laughs> lots of interesting things to say about her alright thank you guys so much see you next week